Hello everyone, Andy Wolverton here from Journeys in Darkness and Light with the new releases in Film Noir for October. Now, we all know October typically belongs to horror, as it should, but that usually means pretty slim pickings in Film Noir releases. But this year, we've got a few interesting choices. So let's take a look. First up, on October the 4th, we have some controversy right out of the gate. Targets, Peter Bogdanovich's directorial debut from 1968, a Region B release from BFI Video. Now, Targets isn't really a film noir, but it's important enough that noir fans should at least know about it. A quiet, reserved Vietnam veteran named Bobby, played by Tim O'Kelly, finally cracks, killing his wife and mother, as well as a delivery boy, before deciding to escalate things by going on a shooting rampage. One of Bobby's stops is a drive-in movie theater where horror movie star Byron Orlock, played by Boris Karloff, is appearing as part of a promotional visit. Targets has gained a following not just for being Bogdanovich's first film, but also for the relevance of the film's themes. Know that Karloff's screen time is limited, but powerful. This is the first time Targets has been available on Blu-ray, and a North American Region A release is probably coming at some point, but if you're a fan of this movie, don't hesitate. Pick this one up. No word yet on extras. Now, that started on October the 4th, being released the very next day on October the 5th, Film Detective is going to bring us The Amazing Mr. X, also known as The Spiritualist, from 1948. We've seen this set up before. A fake spiritualist named Alexis, played by Turhan Bey, attempts to fleece widow Christine Faber, played by Lynn Barry, out of her fortune through a series of seances with her deceased husband, Paul. But Paul, played by Donald Curtis, is still alive and very much wants his wife's money for himself. Plus, Christine's fiancé, played by Richard Carlson, and her younger sister, played by Kathy O'Donnell, begin to suspect there's some shenanigans going on. Despite Kathy O'Donnell's appearance in this film, as well as cinematography by the great John Alton, I'm not a huge fan of this one. But I know plenty of people who are. So I'd like to revisit it, especially to see the new 4K restoration. Extras include an audio commentary by film scholar Jason Ney, an original documentary from Ballyhoo Motion Pictures called Mysteries Exposed, Inside the Cinematic World of Spiritualism, and a full-color booklet featuring an essay by Don Stradley called The Amazing Mr. Bay. So, the highlight of October, it's got to be High Sierra from 1941, directed by Raoul Walsh on two discs from Criterion. A two-disc set? Why two discs? Hold on. With the release of High Sierra, Humphrey Bogart became a superstar and never looked back. Bogart plays Mad Dog Roy Earl, a career criminal just released from prison who goes right back into law-breaking hijinks with the gangster Big Mac. Not that Big Mac. This one's played by Donald McBride. Roy and Big Mac are planning a casino heist. Roy runs across the Goodhue family, which includes Velma, played by Joan Leslie, who captures Roy's heart. But Roy's new accomplices on the heist bring along a young woman named Marie, played by Ida Lupino, who falls in love with Roy. High Sierra marks a pivotal transition from gangster movies to themes of longing, desperation, and attempts to escape one's past, all of which helped define film noir for years to follow. This film has a great supporting cast as well, including Arthur Kennedy, Alan Curtis, Henry Travers, Jerome Cowan, Barton McLean, Willie Best, Cornell Wilde, and more. Now, the extras on this release are <laughs> really impressive. First, the feature is struck from a new 4K digital transfer. Second, the release also includes another entire movie 
Colorado Territory, director Raul Walsh's 1949 Western remake of High Sierra. What else? How about a new conversation on Walsh from film historian programmer Dave Kerr and film historian critic Farron smith Nime. The True Adventures of Raoul Walsh, a 2019 96-minute documentary by Marilyn Ann Moss. There's also Curtains for Roy Earl, a 2003 featurette on the making of High Sierra, a 1997 hour-long documentary called Bogart, Here's Looking at You Kid, from The South Bank Show, a new interview with film and media historian Miriam J. Petty about actor Willie Best, a new video essay with excerpts from a 1976 AFI interview with novelist and screenwriter W.R. Burnett, a radio adaptation of High Sierra from 1944 featuring Bogart and Lupino, and an essay by Imogen Sarah Smith. Whew, man, that's a lot of stuff. This one gets a nearly perfect score from Blu-ray.com. Do not miss this release. Pick up High Sierra. You will be glad you did. Now, many of you probably purchased the Indicator box set, Samuel Fuller at Columbia, 1937 to 1961, a few years back. In fact, it came out in 2018. If you didn't get that set, those films are gonna be available either individually or in one double feature, and one triple feature starting on October the 18th. I'll explain that in just a second. That's a little confusing. These are from Indicator, a UK company, but according to Indicator's website, they're all going to be region-free releases. Now, the first disc out of this set, this is gonna be pulled out separately, is Samuel Fuller Storyteller, Volume 1, which features three movies Fuller co-wrote. It happened in Hollywood from 1937, Adventure in Sahara, 1938, and Power of the Press, 1943. Now, none of these are film noir titles at all, and only Power of the Press may hold any interest for noir fans. Again, those three films are on one disc. Then we have Samuel Fuller, Storyteller, Volume 2, which gets down to noir business with Shockproof from 1949, and Scandal Sheet from 1952, both on a single disc. Both of these are terrific films. Then, The Crimson Kimono from 1953 and Underworld USA 1961 get their own individual discs. I'll link to my previous reviews on all of these titles, all of which are worth owning if you did miss the box set. Now, on October 19th, We've got a bit of a head-scratcher here. Corridor of Mirrors from 1948, directed by Terence Young, who directed Dr. No, From Russia with Love, and other James Bond films. This release comes to us from Cohen Media Group. Introducing this film at Noir City, D.C. in 2016, Eddie Muller called Corridor of Mirrors, quote, probably the most unknown film on our schedule. I think he was right. Muller also explained that British noir differs from American noir in several ways, particularly in the British artistic responses to World War II, which often included art, fantasy, and obsession as ways to cope with war. The film begins with Mafanwi Conway, played by Adana Romney, awakening to find what appears to be a life of ease in a beautiful home with children, a loving husband, etc. But she's keeping secret the fact that she's going to travel to London to meet her lover at Madame Tussauds. When Mafanwe arrives at the famous waxworks, we're all awaiting the appearance of this mysterious lover when she stops before a wax statue of the murderous Paul Mangan, who also triggers Noir's best friend in any country, the flashback. At a nightclub, Mafanwi meets a mysterious debonair man who is, yes, Paul Mangwin, played by Eric Portman, who begins a relentless pursuit of Mafanwi, bringing her to his home, a breathtaking structure filled with elaborate art like you'd see in some of the finest French period films. 
it soon becomes clear that this guy is obsessed with the finer things and Mifanwi in particular. But as we know, there's a secret here. I really won't tell you much more, except you'll see shades of Beauty and the Beast and Vertigo and maybe a couple of other films. Also, don't miss Christopher Lee's feature film debut and only the second credited film for Lois Maxwell. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time on this film, but that's because it is virtually unknown to most audiences. Corridor of Mirrors is wonderfully atmospheric and visually stunning, a beautiful film to watch. Some will not call it noir at all. I'll leave that for you to judge. Sadly, it appears that this release will have no special features other than trailers. It's still going to be worth picking up. On October 26th, we have a single disc double feature from Severin Films, collectively called Franco Noir, consisting of Rafifi in the City from 1963 and Death Whistles the Blues from 1964, both films directed by Jess Franco. Now, I'll admit to never having seen a Franco film, although I know about him, so I'm not entirely sure what to expect, at least at this point in Franco's career. With Rafifi in the City, we have an unnamed state in Central America on the night before a big election. A young police informer seeking to uncover a corrupt senatorial candidate is killed, while a young woman seeks revenge on the hoods who killed her boyfriend. The film is probably most famous as the movie Orson Welles saw before asking Franco to do second unit work on Chimes at Midnight. But some say that Death Whistles the Blues was the film that made that decision for Welles, which is just fine because that's my next point. Death Whistles the Blues finds Lena, played by Perla Crystal, searching for the men who killed her gunrunner husband. When she tells her current husband what's going on, Lena unwittingly sets into motion a complex chain of events. Now, several Franco fans call both of these films some of Franco's most coherent work, and since I've seen none of it, I'm only reporting here. Both films have been restored from the original camera negative, and the release includes an interview with Stephen Thrower, author of Murderous Passions, The Delirious Cinema of Jesus Franco, which is way out of print and super expensive. So that's going to do it for October. I know it's not much, but it's something. So while the ghosts, ghouls, vampires, monsters, and others are running around doing their thing, just remember... Noir Vember is right around the corner. So everyone take care, be safe, and watch some great film noir. Thanks for watching.